Hello, everyone, and welcome to day eight of the Level Up Symposium. My name is Andrew Scriver. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a very special event, an in-progress demonstration of the new opera, I Am Alan Turing, presented by the Associated Designers of Canada, with support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I am one of the co-curators of the symposium and a member of the ADC, and I am very excited to be your host for this event. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that I am coming to you from the settler city of Montreal, which long before colonizers arrived was a place of conference, conflict, and creativity for many Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Abenaki peoples. This land is known by the current caretakers of the land, the Ganyangahaga Nation, as Chachage, which means broken in two because of the way the St. Lawrence River breaks around the island. I am honored and humbled to be here to share and create with you all, so I offer my thanks. Uh, in the spirit of gratitude, I'd also like to bring your attention to the chat window of the Zoom room, where you'll be able to find a land acknowledgement which has been created specifically by our presenters today. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, our primary funder of the symposium as a whole, as well as our other sponsors, the IATSE, University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, York University, and of course, all of our own individual donors. Thank you all very much. So for the information of those of you here in the Zoom room, this event is being recorded and streamed live and will be presented in a freely available archive on our website within a few days of the event. Uh, thank you everyone joining us out in streaming world as well. So you are also watching this live stream either on the Level Up website, which is levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound at HowlRound.com, or through our partners at Toaster Lab on, on the respective pa Facebook pages of the ADC or at Toaster Lab. Now, regardless of your viewing platform out in the streaming world, embedded on the same page as your video is a chat function in the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, your questions can be asked in the chat at any time and will be read out to the presenters later on in the presentation. Uh, for those of you here in the room with us, uh, you can add your questions at any time in the chat below. For this event, uh, unfortunately, there will not be access to live captions. However, the archive of the event will include that option. Uh, we apologize for any inconveniences this will cause. However, if you require technical assistance to support your access to this event in the Zoom room itself, you can chat directly with Patrick in the chat window. It's Level Up Tech. Or in the streaming world, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or to provide feedback following the event. Uh, if you enjoy this session or any of our sessions of the Level Up Symposium, please consider donating to the Associated Designers of Canada to support our National Arts Service Organization in achieving its goals of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Donation links are available on all of our viewing platforms on our website, the ADC's website, or on canadahelps.org. Uh, so please consider donating. Thank you for your patience with all of our announcements. Uh, this presentation is best experienced with headphones. Please, uh, all the viewers within Zoom, could you please turn your screen to gallery view in the uh, top right hand corner of your window? You can select that there. Uh, please also make sure to mute yourself, turn off your video, and uh, please select hide non-video participants. So you can do this either by clicking on someone who does not currently have their video running at uh, top three little dots in the corner and select hide non-video participants, or you can go to your video settings next to the uh, stop video in the bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom window, click on the little arrow, go into your video settings, and there's a little checkbox for that. Um, so this presentation will be starting with an audio piece and there will be a designated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. But as I mentioned before, uh, if you have any questions, please do share those at any time during the presentation. And I think that's it. So thank you very much uh, and enjoy the presentation. human can be constructed to answer this question, why not a machine? The idea that machines can think is not 
knew. Charles Babbage, Alexander Graham Bell, George Bernard Shaw, among others, were interested in the idea. They thought that a man could not be so stupid as that machine. You cannot make a machine to think for you. You cannot make a machine to think for you. You cannot make a machine to think for himself. You cannot make a man to think for himself. We can only hope that machines will eventually compete with women in all fields because a collective human machine conflict will always be, to some extent, unavoidable. Can machines think? No. Consciousness comes from the idea that we are collectively involved in the process of creation. From this idea, we learn about what to think. I feel this kind of feeling. We learn about what to think. What to or not to think. After all, I'm a person who feels a lack of expectation. Who feels a lack of expectation. I feel this kind of feeling when I think of the things I'm thinking about. The moral of this story is how we must strive to protect every human being to the last. The universe is yes. I'm a Turing machine, baby. I'll go on forever, baby. I'm a Turing machine, baby. I'll go on forever, baby. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today, tonight, wherever you happen to be. Uh, if you've just joined in the last few minutes, we'd recommend switching your Zoom display to gallery view or checking the instructions in the chat. My name is Hugh Farrell, and I'm a dramaturg and a producer, and more recently have turned my hand to UX design as the tech world has discovered the benefits of dramaturgy. If you can't tell from my accent, I'm sitting in my apartment in Dublin, Ireland tonight, and I want to say a huge thanks to Andrew and Emily and the whole team at the Level Up Festival for bringing us together despite our distance. We're delighted to share our project with so many of you here on, Zo on the Zoom call and on the live stream tonight, and we're excited to hear your questions and feedback. Uh, we've set aside a whole half hour at the end for questions. So if you have them along the way, if they come up for you along the way, please just put them in the chat and our moderator will collect them all for the end. Today, we're gonna tell you about an opera we've been creating called I Am Alan Turing. I'll give you some background on the project first, and then I'll introduce you to our creative team who are gonna lead a kind of a show and tell of our process and our work so far. Our opera is based on Alan Turing, and for any of those who aren't familiar with him, he was a groundbreaking mathematician and cryptographer who put forward the imitation game or the Turing test for artificial intelligence. Turing famously cracked the German Enigma code during World War II and in the process invented the computer, something he had imagined and published the theory of years before. He was also a biologist and was fascinated by the appearance of numbers everywhere in life, the prime numbers and the Fibonacci sequences in, in particular. He used his first computer at Manchester University in the 50s um, to calculate the chemical basis for uh, the patterns in leopards and zebras, now known as Turing patterns. Tragically, he took his life, aged 41, after he was sentenced to estrogen hormone treatment as a corrective punishment for being gay. For two years, we as a team have been researching Turing and imagining ways to create a Turing test for the theater, blurring the lines between machines and minds. Our process has led us to the archives at King's College in Cambridge, where we read Turing's papers. In the typescript of his 1950 paper on computing machinery and intelligence, where he proposed to consider the question, can machines think? We noticed his handwritten edition, trying to understand what the machines are trying to say. We'll pop a link from that Turing archive in the chat so you can see it for yourself. Over the last two years, the standard of artificial intelligence has exploded. In February 2019, OpenAI in San Francisco released GPT-2, a natural language processing algorithm. GPT-3 came out last year, and we've been working with developers at Yale's Digital Humanities Lab to run an instance of GPT-2, which we trained on the world of words Turing encountered in his life. The GPT-2 algorithm learns to express apparently meaningful sentences based on material it has read. We wondered, if we could collaborate with an AI like this to generate the libretto for an opera. Today, we're gonna to give you a demonstration of how far we've come on that journey and the new directions we're discovering along the way. Since March of 2020, we've been meeting as a technical producing and a devising group three times a week on Zoom. It seems fitting that the computer has become the venue for our interactions on an opera about Alan Turing. What you've heard so far and seen this evening at the start of our presentation is some of what we've been creating. We're working in a virtual space, but our intention is to create a live performance with opera singers, a full choir, live electronics, an orchestra, and all the bells and whistles of theater. On the way, we're interested in creating digital ways to engage our audience and feed into our process. And today or tonight is one of these moments. Thanks again for being here. Keep the questions coming in the chat and we'll collect them in the Q&A at the end. But for now, I'm gonna hand off to the rest of the team to introduce themselves. And we'll begin with our composer, Matthew Sutter. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Sutter. Uh, as you said, I'm the composer on the project and uh, I'm here in New Haven, Connecticut where I, I teach at Yale. And I uh, pitched this idea to, to Hugh and uh, Vlad uh, originally two years ago with the idea that we create a, a monodrama around Turing. Uh, so the idea is that it's not a biographical piece, but it's about his ideas. 
And I wanted to use live electronics. I'm sitting here in my studio surrounded by Moog synthesizers. And uh, I've always been taken as a composer by the way in which uh, small numbers behave. So this is very much part of uh, Turing's uh, writings. Um, and of course, small numbers uh, to, to musicians mean rhythms and uh, intervals. So the piece that you heard first is based in, on the interaction of prime numbers. Uh, and overlaid uh, on top of that is text that was generated by GPT-2. So the text is entirely uh, produced by an artificial intelligence. And then we segue into um, a rather shocking <laughs> discovery for us. We had a brief uh, go on GPT-3, uh, which uh, supposedly is one of the most powerful uh, natural uh, language algorithms models uh, available. It's not, it's not available to the public just yet. And we asked it, write a sexy song in the style of Britney Spears about Alan Turing and three seconds later it produced that song. So um, here we are uh, uh, following a devising process using this text and uh, in some ways really just following where the process takes us. And then the, the last piece is, uh, which was written over the weekend and, and sung gloriously by, uh, by Shola Federan, uh, is a text that Turing wrote uh, called The Nature of Spirit in response to the death of his uh, high school friend, Christopher Morecambe. So we're in a, an interesting place where we have a mixing of aesthetics uh, we intend to use live instruments. Obviously, we're going to be using uh, live electronics, which is, um, is a crazy world to be involved in uh, because it's so uh, performative. This is a, um, a, a collaborative piece. I'm working with uh, Frederick Kennedy, who is a wonderful percussionist, uh, uh, Liam Bellman Sharp, who is a composer and a singer. Uh, I've already, already mentioned uh, Shola, who is an actor and, and an opera singer. And we're working um, somewhat akin to what, a way in which a band might work, where uh, we have a kind of group uh, process, which uh, is largely uh, to do with the circumstances in which we find ourselves right now in the middle of a pandemic. But it's also because the work is driving us to do that uh, as we engage with this AI. Uh, I'd like to hand over uh, to Dakota Stipp, uh, who is going to talk more about GPT-2. All right, thanks. Um, so as Matthew said, I'll, I'll introduce GPT-2 as one of our collaborators, but, but before I do that, we'll, um, we'll go around uh, uh, our, our own our group here and introduce ourselves. So I'm Dakota, um, he, him pronouns, and I'm a designer, um, software developer, uh, working on the, the project in a number of ways. Uh, Fred, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Fred Kennedy, um, fellow Canadian to all the Canadians. Nice to virtually be back in my home country <laughs> for a moment. Uh, I'm a percussionist and sound designer, music producer, um, and uh, also based in New Haven, just a few blocks from Matthew. Hey, uh, I'm Tyler Kiefer. Um, I'm here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'm uh, one of the few sound designers we have on this project and uh, theater maker. Hi, I'm Julia Schäfer. I'm originally from Switzerland, but tuning in from Brooklyn. I'm a graphic designer and recent graduate from the Yale School of Art. And I support the team with all sorts of graphic inputs and visual communication. Hi, I'm Emily Riley, um, calling in from Brooklyn, but originally from England via Ireland. Um, I'm a dramaturg and also a creative producer and know something about communications and publicity in the theater world as well. Um, I'm working with the team being many different things right now as we're still very much in process. Hi everybody, I'm Vlad Voino. Uh, I'm a theater maker and um, visual designer. Um, I'm normally primarily working in video and projection technology. Um, I've been, yeah, like Matthew said, I've been kind of 
engaging with this for a couple of years now. It's unbelievable that it, it feels like it's been that long. Um, and it's um, been a, a really exciting. Um, I'm currently based in Vancouver um, and I teach at Simon Fraser University. Hi, I'm Liam Bellman Sharp. I'm uh, originally from Australia, but based in New Haven with some of the other folks here at the moment. Uh, I am a composer and sound designer and musician, and I'm sort of working on this project in those capacities, as well as sort of like some sort of studio and synth wrangling. Hi, everyone. I'm Madeline Pages, uh, she, her, hers, currently calling in also from New Haven. Uh, I'm a dramaturg and currently a student uh, in dramaturgy at the Yale School of Drama. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sholaf Adiram, and I'm an actor currently studying at Yale School of Drama. Um, and I'm a singer, an opera singer. <laughs> and I'm also most recently a writer and director. And I'm supporting the group by singing and acting and devising, theater making. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so there's our team and one more member to introduce um, and that's GPT-2. So I'll talk a bit about that. So um, GPT-2 and GPT-3 are both um, natural language models. Uh, and so at a high level, a natural language model um, works by decomposing language into tokens um, and then creating a graph of probabilities that a given token will follow another token um, based on its input. So with um, Doug Duhame at the Digital Humanities Lab um, and also um, with Farid Abdul, who's a, an intern with the Center for Collaborative Arts and Media at Yale, um, we created an interface for the team to interact with an instance of GPT-2, as mentioned earlier, um, and that's a language model by OpenAI. And so that's generated a bunch of text for us. Um, we also had a brief opportunity to interact with GPT-3. Um, so a lot of this output is, you know, a little kind of meaningless without context, and we'll, we'll show you what it means. But when it's spoken um, by a person and when it's sung, it takes on kind of an impressive human quality that we're all fascinated with. Um, our devising process has been inspired by these conversations with the with these models. We've tried to figure out how to get our own minds to generate language, taking inspiration from Einstein's ideas of combinatory play, where he would play the violin to free his consciousness of logic in order to form new ideas. We developed a series of games that we um, sort of play in an ongoing way with each other based on generating words, imagery, and dramatic scenes um, impulsively with no filter in the moment using loose conceptual associate associations and other kinds of parameters. The idea is to create rules for ourselves that reflect the rules within a natural language, uh, within which a natural language model operates. Our aim is to think without thinking. And to give you a sense of what the AI, what the models produce and what they're capable of um, and how we're using it, we'll now read a few selections um, to demonstrate the range and the kind of content that they, they generate. Uh, what I'm about to read was created by GPT-3 um, and the prompt was to write a poem in the style of Dr. Seuss. When a packet hits a pocket on a socket on a port and a protocol is defined in a transport on a host, you know precisely what the CPU is going to do. Now a packet hits a pocket on a socket on a port, but the protocol has the wrong address or the queue is full or the pockets ripped and the packet hits the deck. He's not out, he's not safe, he's not even in. He's in the ether somewhere and the CPU waits for him. This is what we call a hung state and it is bad. If the CPU could talk, he would say more haste, less speed. Um, and I'm gonna read a response from GPT-2, our model that we, um, trained on different things that Turing had written or, uh, written and read in his lifetime. And this, uh, we posed the question, what is art? And its response is, art is the process of making something beautiful. It is the most important of the human activities. The most important human activity is the making of art. The most important human activity is the making of art. The human activity of making art consists of a series of steps. In the simplest form, we have the following steps. One, select the material. 2. Measure it. 3. Mix it. 4. Form it. 5. Place it in the display. 
6. Make it look like a work of art. 7. Make it available for sale. 8. Make it available for reproduction. 9. Make it available for comparison and evaluation. 10. Make it available for comparison and evaluation. The human activity of making art is the most important human activity. It is the most important human activity because it is the one uh, it is the one which is most difficult to perform. It is the most important human activity because it is the one which is most important to judge. And uh, here's an example also from GPT-2 where the question posed was why we would need machines. And the response was, we needed the machine to make the human being comfortable. It is to give them something to have with them on the job that is safe, comfortable, and satisfying. I mean the very human feeling of having good food every day and having a comfortable bed every night. If we had built a machine that did that, we could have built something that would probably be useful for a long time. That is why I think there can be no doubt that someday there is going to be a great improvement in the quality of life and in the comfort of life, but I have no illusions about the future. This I think was one of the earlier samples that we received from GPT-2. Um, and uh, it says, you cannot say, I do not believe in God, because if you did, the machine would say, I have no reason to believe in God, but you do. This is also from GPT-2. I don't have the prompt for this one, uh, but it is presented with an explicit language warning and with no comment. Um, and verbatim. I put it to you that you are only pretending to be a man. You are not a man. You are a piece of shit. 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 So there's a, a, a fun fun variety of uh, some of the responses we get. Now we'll, we'll, um, we'll move to a kind of a live demonstration of uh, our devising process or a taste of it to see how we kind of input some of the um, language model text into our own work. Great, and as Dakota gets ready to lead us through um, the devising session, which we are doing live and we have no idea what the prompts are that he's prepared for us today, um, Decoder is kind of our devising spirit guide that we uh, meet with him every Friday as a group and we co-write together. Um, and so we're gonna be sharing this devising process with you um, by screen sharing so you can watch us write in a Google Doc. Um, for those of you that are at uh, home and watching on, this, on the live stream, you'll get a link to the Google Doc so you can watch us in real time. And for those of us in the Zoom call, um, we'll screen share with you right now. And as you watch us work, I invite you to pay attention to words, phrases, and ideas that resonate with you and to look out for language ticks and patterns you see developing. Um, and we'd love to hear about what stuck out for you during the conversation part of today's presentation. So here we go over into the Google Doc. All right, looks like we're mostly accounted for. I think I'm missing one name, perhaps. Um, and we'll have people join with the, uh, the view link as well. So, all right, team, we're gonna jump on down um, to the bottom here where you see me typing. This is Dakota. Um, and we're gonna start with our first question, our first prompt uh, with about one minute to respond.
All right, we're gonna uh, start to wrap it up. Finish your response. Great, now we're jumping on down to the bottom um, to the, a couple spaces down below. We'll move on to the next question. begin to wrap this up. Finish your, your thought there. We're down to page five now. Our next question. start to wrap this one up. Finish your thought. We're on down to the bottom here. Next question. Last question here on the bottom. and uh, begin to wrap up your other thought. Excellent, thanks for, thanks for playing team. So now we're just gonna jump up to the top of the document and uh, uh, read our responses to each question um, in a rotating order. 
So we'll start with our, our, uh, our first question here on page two, who is Alan Turing? And Matthew will begin us with the, the first response. Man who invented computer. Lonely, lives on, punished by UK government. Luminary. Hold his computer, baby. Dead. A life in thought. Emily, you're muted. Hello. Sorry, I had to run for my charger. Can uh, someone take my go this time? Yep. Yeah. Uh, gay. Genius. Cyclist. Shola. Visionary. Visionary. Code breaker. Inner life. Mystery. So British. Schoolboy. Romantic. He enjoyed nature. Biologist. Fear itself. Uh, Not me. Yeah, go ahead. It looks oh. like we broke our Google Doc this time around. Yeah, we um, did. Because I can't grab that text. So let's jump on to a marathon runner, whoever was next. Uh, a marathon, a marathon runner. runner. <laughs> <laughs> Not free. Enjoyed running. A perfectly ordinary homosexual. A mathematician. Scholar. A hero. A convict. Homosexual. He was a homosexual. Cryptologist, a code breaker, a patent seeker. Brilliant man. Mathematician. I think he was involved with World War II. A humble human. Alan Turing is dead. He has been dead for quite some time now. He is, he is survived by the things that bear his name. Humanist. Not a party animal. Awkward. Alan Turing rode a bike with a gas mask on. The gas mask was on Alan, not on the bike. He rode the <laughs> bike through England. Okay, next question, what is opera? Stuffy. Extravagant. Big feelings. Expensive. Spectacle. Lucius. Often oh, about no. women killing themselves if they are sad about men. A sometimes long and slow form of song. Grand in its presentation and budgets, sometimes. <laughs> Boring. Big drama. Did. Voices. Everything. Vikings. A way to explore the human. Irrelevant. A warm soaking. Lush. Cold sometimes. Explosions. Some of its parts. A total work of art. A Turing test. Song drama. Music does the work and the voice plays the emotion. Can be improvised or not. Opera is when people sing aloud. Crazy people with crazy ideas. You can sing that loud and not sing opera. People mostly don't use microphones, but sometimes they secretly do, even the Met. <laughs> Emotions. As a word, opera just means work, as in opus or operate. An art form involving loud singing and very elaborate set design. What is intelligence? Intel intelligence. Go for it. Oh, sorry. Are, are, are we going round or are you going to take over, Matthew? Intelligence is bodily. Intelligence is a kind of spirit. Intuition. Experience, real life experience. Aptitude. An evolving thing, not set in stone. Don't, want to, don't you want to know? <laughs> Ideas harnessed. Secrets. Amassed. 
quoted. To know or to not know. Power. Hidden. Money. The economy stupid. Elon Musk. An agency somewhere. Something machines can have and humans. Understanding the universe or oneself. Do machines have selves? Can they understand their selves? Generally, a correlation of what is in our minds that have been collected by the brain through the use of our sensory inputs that begins to create self-awareness. Social trust. Intelligence is the ability to build a model of the world based on your experience of it and predict what will happen next to the world. Reflecting deeply on something. The ability to differentiate. What is natural intelligence if artificial intelligence is a thing? It's what makes me human. The force behind all that is. The voices in my head. What does it mean to trust? Safety. To believe in safety. To believe you are held. To believe the pain will be manageable. To be brave in growth. To be in communion with others. To grasp at hope. Faith, understanding, understanding, connection, and knowing. Security in the knowledge that truth is safe between us. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Freedom. Love. Humility. Continual process. Dispassion. Fear itself. Not being able to produce. Criticism. Being shown myself. Fear itself. Not being able to produce. Criticism. Being shown myself. Falling. Being connected to the people you love. Catching. Vulnerability. Danger. To trust is to live fully. Togetherness without fear. Power and choice to choose to believe. Giving without expectation. To let go. To forgive. Part of being human. To look at each other in the eye and know truth. A sickening feeling that you might be wrong. Trust is money. Believing the model you have made of someone in your head to be accurate. A reason to live. If your mind is in peace. The opposite of antitrust. The opposite of Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Trust is like when a cat slow blinks at you or closes its eyes around you or lets you touch its feet. <laughs> Love jumping of a bridge. Unachievable. What are you afraid of? Afraid of being discovered as a fraud. When I was eight, I used to have trouble sleeping, would stare up at the ceiling and have nightly terror thoughts about the fact that the universe is so big. Inability to act. That, thou, that those I love will find out I'm a phony. Being stranded, being lost, floating off into space. Poisonous spiders. White supremacy. Nuclear holocaust. Imprisonment. Sorry, Nazis and their enablers. Losing someone else's mind. Imprisonment. Being all alone. Being found out that the sadness might creep in and never leave. Hordes of rats. Solitude. Running out of money. That when I rub my hands into my eyes, there will be chili on them. <laughs> Ignorance. Sinkholes. Losing mum. Ineffectuality. That brings us to the end of our our list. So normally, our next step um, after this would be to begin to um, play an associative game uh, where we try to connect uh, bits and pieces from the different categories and prompts that we were 
uh, given and try to come up with um, larger kind of structural scenes around those things. But of course, for time, we won't do that today. And now I'll hand it over to um, Vlad and Julia to talk a little bit about uh, the visual aspects of the show. Thank you, Dakota. Um, Vlad Dakota. will share the screen in a second. All right. So what you see here is the website for the project that we are developing simultaneously with our weekly devising sessions. And um, we'll post the link in the chat. Uh, feel free to sign up. So Vlad is signing up here um, to get updates on the opera and so on. And as you enter the website, the, it all kind of builds itself up automatically. And uh, the website functions as a trailer in the first place, as well as informing about the project, introducing the team and uh, listing sponsors. Um, so yeah, when you access the website on your computer, you will notice that it plays the trailer song that you heard at the very beginning. So it's a one page that starts on the top and scrolls down. And uh, we were looking for a cinematic feel that combines the text from the devising with images that we converted to ASCII. And um, Vlad will uh, elaborate on that in a second. And the layout is all made in Sublime text, which is a source code editor. You see the, the row numbers on the left are kind of indicating the, the rows of code. And um, the layout and the typefaces we used are inspired by the original drawings from Turing and simulate typewriter outputs for reports and uh, technical documentation. And yeah, the website will become an ongoing archive of the work and um, yeah, keep, keep uh, looking into it. And I will share screen now um, and Vlad will talk a little more about uh, the ASCII. Yeah, so part of um, one of the things that I was working with in the depths of the pandemic, kind of sitting at home, um, I um, I was curious to see if I could, we were playing so much in training um, the, the AI, uh, the RGPT2 model with papers and different um, um, uh, text um, that we wanted to kind of recognize and essentially create the model based on this text that we had. Um, and I was curious, okay, there are, and, and, and I think Julia will show you some of the other things that we've done with kind of um, AI that is created particularly for image uh, manipulation and generation. Um, but I was curious if I could get the language model that is based on text to kind of work with um, images. Um, and sort of, this is sort of how I arrived at this kind of like ASCII, um, this, what we call the ASCII, which is kind of converting images into sort of text and what you're seeing right now is just a quick little demo video of um, what happens when you take images like these apples that you saw at the beginning and convert them to text to then input into the language model and train the language model with these images. It's ultimately just recognizing patterns and, and then um, building on based on some variables, uh, essentially um, different um, iterations or, or um, combinations uh, based on probability. Um, of, of that image. And then you just keep, for example, in, in the images that you're seeing right now, you see the apple kind of gets more and more deconstructed. Um, and so what's happening is that I'm grabbing um, the apple and turning up the, the, that has been turned into text and turning up the randomness um, variables in the engine. Um, and then I've just taken photographs of that output and I've put it inside of uh, Touch Designer. Um, and in Touch Designer, I can kind of VJ manipulate live um, this animation that's being created of this kind of deconstructed um, text apple. Um, and so, it, yeah, it, it got into like a little bit of pattern matching and, and, and pattern recognition, um, which I think Julia can speak a little bit about in the next couple of slides. She'll show you some other examples that we've played with and how it sort of relates back to um, Alan Turing and his work. 
Thank you. So when thinking about the visual world that we kind of inhabit with, with Turing's work, we were also looking into archives. So these are Turing's diagrams for um, his article he wrote on morphogenesis. The images are held at the King's College archive at the Cambridge University. Turing describes in the 1952 published article, the chemical basis of mor morphogenesis, how patterns in nature, such as stripes and spirals can arise naturally from a homogeneous uniform state. As for example, in the fur of certain animals or in the skin of the puffer fish. Thinking about collaborating with an AI on text, as we've done a lot in devising, we also starting to experiment creating images from text with a software called Runway ML. So the text you see on the top, Alan Turing has an apple on his desk, is a text that came from a devising session and then was translated by the software back into an image. Alan Turing is keen, is a keen and agile code breaker fighting to be free. Or Alan Turing is actually a fisherman and also he's not He's not reading short stories. Or Alan Turing dressed as a woman. And when kind of playing this through, um, I realized that the, the data model was mostly trained on interiors. Um, so you might see in some of these that um, there are parts of like rooms and uh, yeah, room interiors that it's made out of, which was interesting. Um, yeah, I will hand back now to Vlad and he will show us something that he has been working on, which is a flip top display. All right, thank you. And if someone could spotlight me, I'll just change my source here, reduce things. Gotta turn off the background or it doesn't work. This is my little studio. Um, and what I'll do is I'll switch cameras. Um, and so, yeah, so like I said, we've, we've, I've been using Touch Designer as a way to kind of um, explore um, a bunch of different um, physical computing elements. And I've been messing with um, uh, Arduinos and sensors, um, as well as you know some of the earlier conversations that I had with Matthew about what the set would look like in terms of this. I, I, I've always imagined some kind of um, set piece that could evolve and and kind of uh, be mechanized. So I was I've been researching into making kind of mirrors and uh, moving mirrors, and not just one IQ mirror or something like that theatrically, but like you know talking like 30, 40 mirrors um, to use with projectors or lasers to kind of be able to. Um, build the space as the piece is um, um, evolving. And, you know, that was always kind of, we were always discussing that as part of the physical installation of the piece. Um, and uh, more recently, kind of as that conversation evolved and, and Matthew was really um, kind of investing in, in his time with the um, synthesizers, the analog synthesizers, I felt like We've spent so much time on screen um, digitally that it would be interesting if we could start moving some of this uh, material into kind of a physical space. Um, and I had seen, um, I had seen, I can't remember where I saw it first, but I, I was really, I was really uh, intrigued by this technology. It's sort of um, their their older displays. Um, they're called flip dot displays, and what they do, I'll just show you right now. Hopefully that's working. Um, and what they do is that they're actually. Um, little uh, magnetized displays, and what they do is they um, can each each pixel can be turned on or off. Um, it makes a wonderful sound. I think you might be able to hear it if I turn on my mic a little bit. Um, and it's sort of what they used on bus displays before uh, LEDs were a thing. Um, they're actually very fragile and hard to maintain, so I understand why we switched out. But there is something kind of wonderfully physical about being able to make displays um, that behave this way. Um, and so part of 
what I've done with um, some of these touch designer patches is generate ways of manipulating um, these displays live. So I could feed them video, I could feed them uh, kind of pre-sampled materials. Um, I think I have uh, a version of an eye here. Let's see if that's, oh, well, that one's not working right now. But, um, but yeah, so looking at different ways to kind of you know, physicalize um, some of the ideas that we've been looking at. Um, so that's been kind of an interesting exploration and um, continuation of, of um, this kind of physicalizing research that we can do while we are in, um, in quarantine. Um, whoops. Um, yeah, I'll pass it on to Julia, who had some things to say about also kind of some of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of moving forward with some of the visual elements, um, as well as the website. Yeah, I think we hand over now to um, you and Emily. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for staying with us this long. Um, we're just going to give a very brief overview of some next steps for the project. Um, and then we're going to move straight into some um, questions, which we're really excited to hear your thoughts. So as you can tell, we're still very much in process. Um, right now, our roles in the project are fluid, but our sort of various expertise are coming to, to the fore as we start crafting material. Um, we co-write together. We weigh in on creative discussions. Um, so that's where we are right now in the process. Um, I, I guess we had planned, well, we um, we managed to have a, a, a one in-person workshop back in 2019, and we planned last summer to have a whole series of workshops uh, in New Haven, but obviously that's all stopped because of the pandemic. So our next big step is to try and reschedule that workshop where we can carve out a few days together to review everything we've generated so far, which is uh, an extraordinary amount of material and to start to kind of refine and deepen the material that we've generated, the stuff that resonates with us the most as we start to map it into a, an overall structure for the opera. And we've been talking a lot as we've been in process and as it's been sort of this unwieldy amount of time and we're staring down the barrel of who knows when theater will be back, um, of about of, of exploring a staged work in progress showing this is sort of a process showing that we've been given giving you today but we we've been thinking a lot about creating a virtual staged work in progress showing so we can really start to test out some of these materials on an audience um so that's another thing that's sort of circulating in our in our collective brains for another next step for the project yeah, and I guess to make all that happen, we're also looking at trying to attract uh, funding partners. Uh, we're trying to identify particular institutions that can add to our list of supporters, which include the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale, the Yale Centre for Collaborative Media and Arts, and the Yale Centre for British Art. So we've been really grateful for their support so far. And eventually, obviously, as we said before, our dream is to get a tourable staged opera made, um, a live experience that seamlessly integrates the various uh, virtual elements that we've been exploring um, so well in this um, sort of internet space that we've been making the piece on. And I think that's everything. So I, I think it's our turn to open it up to the floor, uh, the virtual floor, and invite your questions if anyone has any. We'd be delighted to hear them. Also noticing comments, all welcome as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes this an opera? I'm going to I'm going to field that over to um, Matthew Sutter, our our resident composer. Matthew, what makes this an opera? That's a really good question. Um, I think uh, this uh, is going to, is an opera because simply because of the intention behind it. Uh, there will be operatic voices, um, and the what we didn't talk about um, too much is the is the theatrical conceit. So, in a Turing test, you have um, three figures 
So it's almost a kind of sort of Brechtian um, play. So you have A, B, and C. A and B may or may not be a computer, and, and C is the moderator. So we'll have those figures um, uh, on stage. So there are at least three singers, and maybe that there are other, um, other voices that step in to be uh, uh, that come from parts of, of, of Turing's life and are around his work, although it's not, it's not really, it's never intended as a, a biographical um, piece. But going back to say um, uh, the first opera, which and we, we typically cite um, Monteverdi's Affair, which is, you know, was written at the beginning of the, of the 1600s, he took the working parts of existing um, church music and other kinds of theatrical uh, works like masks, etc. Um, so you have recitatives, arias, choruses, and, and um, other vocal pieces, and put them in together into a new form. So in some sense, we're taking things that already exist, and um, through um, this devising process, which is an artificial intelligence, we're coming up with we're not making claims to it for, for a new form, we're just really sort of following where this um, um, leads. I mean, but there is a kind of surprising aesthetic um, uh, a range here. And we've already got something that, um, you know, influenced by Britney Spears, arguably, um, through to uh, things that are much more conventionally recognizable as, as opera. But I think the healthy thing um, for me as a, as a composer is that my preconceptions of what opera is um, has already been shattered, right? So and this, is, this is my third opera and, uh, you know, they're really big experiences to, 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 to write and to produce and then receive all the criticism afterwards. Uh, you know, opera critics have more heckles per square inch than any other um, follicled species. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the short answer is there's an opera because we say it is, um, but we're we're trying to uh, we're trying to figure that that out through this collaborative process. So that's a long, somewhat sort of rambly answer. But there you go. Great. The next question. Um that came in, I'm going to read it out loud before I try and field it somewhere. Maybe Hugh, you can be thinking about who this should go to while I read it out loud. Do the AI have voices? And how do you give computer a voice? Well, that's interesting because in the original Turing test, the uh, Turing sets it up that the the computer can only speak through a teleprompter, through a, you know, through written text. But for the purposes of our opera, um, we've been giving a lot of voices to uh, how GPT-2, to GPT-2's language. Um, I, I suppose to, Tyler might talk a bit about the mix of how we uh, add voices to them. Yeah, sure. Um, it was, you know, in crafting the first piece you heard at the beginning of our presentation, um, it was all recorded, it was all text generated by GPT-2, but it was recordings of each of our voices and I was able to stack them on top of each other and through different effects and such kind of create a um, voice that is kind of a conglomerate of all. And, and it's been exciting on this journey trying to figure out what that exact question of what is the voice of this AI. And I think um, at this point it is all of our voices in a way that is not necessarily trying to trick you like a Turing test, but a machine, um, why would it be limited to just uh, the robotic voice that we kind of associate with computers, um, especially in the age of now when technology is growing so quickly. So I think uh, right now it's, it's a lot of us um, together all kind of like speaking through the text that GPT-2 is generating for us. Yeah, and that's, I will also say that there's something about like trying to, we, we do a lot of, and that's why it's not an opera written by AI or something, because the, the AI is a participant, a collaborator, and we're cherry picking a lot of what we're reading, right? We go through uh, a lot of versions of it and we kind of throw in what, what's happening with the, the AI generation and throw it into our devising text. So it's not like some kind of a holy vision always, um, but it is interesting to humanize the voice and to kind of try to give it 
something that's a bit more robust than just what shows up on screen. Um, so I think that's also, I don't know if that helps answer that question too. And I think going with our commendatory play of like throwing logic out the door, we cherry pick these things, but it's also really exciting to work with this thing that it'll give us random crazy responses sometimes. And some things are right on, but to be able to kind of use it to get ourselves out of our own logic uh, has been really fruitful, I think as well. So another thing just to say quickly is that we, we are using um, bow coders. So we have hardware bow coders to uh, resynthesize um, spoken and sung uh, uh, voices. Um, so speech synthesis is something I've been interested in for a long time. So if you, we could possibly use that or we haven't, we haven't, uh, we've been using vocoding, coding, but we haven't used um, actual speech synthesis. Yeah, because in some ways I'm sort of trying to stay away from the digital domain and, and concentrate on, on, on analog here. Uh, the other interesting thing is that GPT-2 has been used to uh, create music. So there is an open AI application with this uh, language model called Jukebox. And interestingly, once we started using GPT-2 to create text and, and we're in communication with open AI, they came back to us and said, what do you think about this new application that we're using? Um, so you can uh, create uh, like an Ella Fitzgerald song in her voice using lyrics that she never wrote or music that she never sang that sounds like her singing. So it's a, it's a fairly um, shocking, wonderful, disturbing um, thing. So there is that possibility, although we're not so interested in algorithmically produced um, music for us, it's all it's all about this sort of the theatrical um, uh, representation of of of, a, of this um, Turing test. That actually segues really nicely into another question that's further down in the queue, but I'm going to bring it up now because it connects. But uh, and um, Tyler, you touched on this a little bit, but in terms of GPT two being a collaborator as a group, how much control do we find ourselves giving over to the AI from a methodological perspective? Tyler, you just talked a little bit about the kind of getting us out of our boxes of thinking and sort of busting us out of parameters a little bit. But I wondered, um, I'm gonna throw this over to Dakota a little bit and then whoever else can jump in, but um, control and GPT-2, from your opinion, like how, how much control does GPT-2 have in our process? Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I think, first of all, I just want to say, I think control is a very kind of an interesting kind of jarring word, actually, to think about in our process, because it feels like most of what we've been targeting is kind of relinquishing control in some ways. Um, and I, so I think that's kind of just a sidebar, you know, answer that um, it kind of like over time, I feel like we've developed a kind of unified voice or a unified kind of like uh, ecosystem of voices and ideas um, in interacting with the the language models and, and with each other um, so that the idea of control is hard to to kind of pinpoint in this context but um, if I change it to something more like filtering or uh, kind of selecting or curating um, I think we find ourselves generally um, and as the kind of coordinator of the devising uh, activities for for much of it um, we tend to kind of use it use the output of the language model as inspiration or as source material, if you will, and then think of our kind of creating process together as a transformation of that material or um, an elaboration on it, if you will. So um, some of it does make it to the end, as you kind of heard in the, the Brittany inspired, the, the possibly Brittany inspired tune, as Matthew said, um, and in the opening, um, but also it, as you suspect, and as these questions are indicating, an overwhelming majority of it doesn't make it very far at all because it's, you know, either extremely prejudiced or um, sort of nonsensical. And so um, I think we find ourselves pretty much filtering um, until until we find that it's reached a kind of transformation level of satisfaction of the, the collective voice or idea. Um, it's my best first attempt at that, if anybody else wants to jump in. Well, and I think what's also really exciting is as we've continued to grow in this process, and we've in our devising sessions, we've put in uh, uh, text from the AI and that we have generated. And now, you know, Matthew described how uh, the stage version of this is inevitably going to be somewhat of a, 
a live Turing test for the audience. And in devising with this machine, we've found ourselves kind of creating a Turing test for ourselves because we're putting in text. And at this point, somewhat not sure if it was one of us that wrote it or if it was the computer that wrote it and if it was a mixture of the two. So I think the blurring of the lines has become really exciting in our process also. Yeah. Q, you want to say anything else? Yeah, I just I, I spot another question that's on this theme, uh, which is uh, further down the list from Liz. What kind of dramaturgical questions do you ask when you receive the GPT-2's text? And how do you prioritize which text from the AI becomes part of the final script? I think that's in the same vein. I think we, we do a lot of editing on it, of course. Um, but I think what we do try to play in our both in our devising games and when we're playing with GPT-2 or 3 is to try and go through massive chunks of text and discern patterns, see what kind of things come up again and again, or what kind of arguments appear again and again. Um, so that's definitely one of one of the kind of dramaturgical processes that we apply to it. I don't know if anyone else has any other response to that. I was I also, just say, go ahead, Dakota. No, no, you go. I was just going to say that that the this piece, as Matthew mentioned before, we're not interested in doing a biopic. It's a it's an opera about ideas, and as Hugh said, like rhythm, pattern, um, those are the kinds of dramaturgical principles that we'll be playing with a lot. Um, it'll be less about there's a story that we're arcing out and more an accumulation of um, ideas that we arc out into a kind of rhythmic pattern that hopefully will result in a in a meaningful, rich experience for um, an audience member. And just w w one thing really um, quickly that I think is worth saying is, so when Hugh and I went to visit the King's College archive and sat there and read the papers back to back, in this marathon reading session. Um, and we weren't allowed to speak to each other because of the, it was a really small room and they were very concerned that we would, you know, we, we would disrupt everybody else. But we, we had these sort of mind blowing moments when we would read um, marginalia that, that, that Turing wrote. What's really interesting is that GPT-2 preserved the way that Turing wrote, he, he, the, the algorithm preserved the voice. So Turing wrote in a, in a, obviously in a scientific, somewhat dispassionate, way but also in a slightly awkward fashion and the and the algorithm preserves that so i think that's one of the great uh, really exciting things is that we feel like this um this the, his voice in terms of the way that he, he wrote in thanks is somehow preserved um and in, uh, in the responses that we get back from the ai great I'm, I'm seeing sort of follow-up questions and there are a couple of questions that I want to flag that sort of connect to the ethical side of some of this that I, I want to bring into the room. Um, someone has asked, I'm going to find it now because I was, you know, what are your, our thoughts, your thoughts on the way AI reflects our prejudices and systemic oppressions, i.e. data profiling algorithms targeting minorities, um, because that is how the AI has been taught. Um, who wants to take this? I don't know who I, mean, I, I can here. start a little Last, bit. I feel like ahead. I feel like that it's it is um yeah they are they are a little bit um, terrifying in a way because they do to to get them to work you have to not only you know we we with um with GPT two for example we're feeding it very specific uh, data sets but that's actually fine tuning like we're practically just adding at the end sprinkling kind of the thing that the things that we want to work with within the AI but the rest of the model GPT two is actually a collection, a scrape, and depending on how much of it scrapes, right, or how much of it accumulates in terms of like the internet, I think is sort of the data sample that they're using, is that they just send out a, a crawler, it just collects tons and tons of text from the internet and, and uses that data. So it's going to collect everything and it's going to collect things that are not pretty because it's the internet is, is kind of a, a, a pretty uh, scary place in, in, it, in its kind of entirety. Um, so, so that, that like, yeah, the, you know, in a way the AI reflects kind of in, in a way our own humanity in, in perfect, right? It's not, um, it's not going to be, uh, a, 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 you know, there are, there are ways and there's ways to curate that. And I think a lot of the people that are coding, um, systems with, to interact with, um, artificial intelligence in language models, there's a lot of, um, effort in trying to kind of monitor and filter and, and, and take care of it. But yeah, it, it is imperfect and it does sometimes say 
pretty um, inappropriate things. Um, but but that's just because the majority of the data is framed on is, is just swaths of the internet um, without any real um, detail. Thanks, Vlad. Anyone else want to add? Should we move on to the next question? So, so there's a great question here that I want to um, pull up. What would you want to achieve in making this an in-person experience rather than an online or screen performance? I'm going to take a stab and then I'm going to hand it off to someone else. Um, this team has heard me say this before, but I may be the most analog person in this room, in this Zoom room. Um, but I, I often talk about that moment when either as a group when we're devising together where something beautiful happens and the, the language and the text kind of comes together in this beautiful way or when GPT-2 spits out something that we're just like, what? And, and the feeling that that gives, at least me, is something like a seance, like we're somehow communing in some way with Alan Turing. And I think there's something very magical about bringing people together into an actual room in real time and thinking about uh, what is the structure of a seance and how can we be thinking about technology and computers in a way that is very sen sensorial. Um, at the end of the day, we spend a lot of time stroking screens with our hands and there's a lot of intimacy that exists there. So the in-person element that um, of theater, and we also all love theater is the other part of this and that's what we spend a lot of our time and energy making but i think there's a really interesting juxtaposition between the kind of perceived uh distance of technology and the intimacy of technology and for us that moment when we know that we've made something that really fits with what we're doing and that kind of hairs on the back of the neck alan Turing is in the room with us feeling so that's my attempt to answer that question. If other folks want to chime in, please. I mean, I'll also say as a um, sound designer for theater, it's uh, what really gets me excited is, is having um, control of the experience for the audience in a way that is, you know, every room that you go into is kind of a different character for us when we're talking about sound. In the theater, we have the opportunity to really use it in a physical domain too and can create visceral responses and uh and really shape the the whole the physical feeling in the room so i think as a sound designer it's i always prefer a room where i can you know choose if it's like coming from where how much is the sub shaking your ass so much that it's just like it, you can feel it in your bones you know that's something you can't get if it's you know, people listening on their laptop speakers or, or earbuds or something, you know, that, that we really get that sort of control and full experience uh, in the theater. I'll also add a little bit that I think is interesting to think about because I feel like our intention was or from the beginning was originally to make a like a, a live touring performance and just situationally we find ourselves exploring these other mediums. Um, which has been kind of interesting in a sense because now we've developed this website with which I've sank a, a lot of time into that I feel like on a normal theatrical process we probably wouldn't have done. We've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make this work on screen and uh, and in on online and playing with these kind of uh, devising techniques through so that we can work kind of at a distance altogether. Which I feel like these are all things that we would have never probably tried. So I think it's opened up this world of opportunities. But I think. Yeah, I think I think in a way this this opera has worked and, and will continue to work in a, in a variety of mediums probably too, right? I think that there's something about the way that we're exploring different things will affect ultimately how we kind of piece together this this final performance. So I think I think yeah, figuring out you know do we end up using streaming elements? Do we use um, some of the kind of web interface things to to kind of uh, exchange data? And with the audience, you know, the, there's going to be, I think, a lot of things that can come out of this period um, that will affect kind of how we kind of piece together the, the final form. Yeah. See another question here. Uh, it's from Andrew again, purely technical question, but how do you gain access to the AI and where do you input your text and questions? I think Dakota, you might be able to show us um, 
on a screen sure. share of yeah, our yeah I'll, I'll just like share my screen real quick and show you um, what we're kind of working with. And it'll, it'll be really fast. Um, let me make sure I have the right window. So you should have um, a, a browser window. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. So um, essentially, we, you know, along with a lot of help from the Digital Humanities Lab and with um, with Fareed, the programming intern at the CCAM, um, we built this really simple interface to interact with the language model. Um, so we've got some stuff kind of behind the scenes where we trained that I won't, I won't show you the code and the low level stuff, but um, where we trained the model on some writing of Turing um, and some of the stuff he read. And um, it's essentially just like a, there's a, a uh, you know, a bunch of Python code running in the background that's running the server. Um, we have to, the hard part about hosting this is that it requires a lot of GPU uh, um, power in particular. So we have um, a server that's generously kind of um, allowed to us by the Digital Humanities Lab. Um, so our team has access to this by VPNing. If you try that link, it won't work for you, unfortunately. Um, but we do have access to this model and we can kind of type in, you know, change, adjust a variety of parameters with GPT-2 and try to get responses from it. We have considered, um, you know, many times we've considered trying to open this uh, to more people besides our team. Um, and the short answer is that it really comes back to that ethical question and that, that prejudice question that it's really easy to implement filters on words and phrases that are no-nos, right? We've already done that. We've said certain words and phrases are just not allowed. We'll never get those. It's much, much harder to filter ideas, um, more especially like larger abstract ideas that are um, deeply embedded in the patterns of the internet. So until we really figure that out, which, you know, I don't want to understate that as a small problem. That's a massive problem to work out. Um, I'm not sure that we'll be kind of opening that interface to the general public for a while. Yeah. I think also though, Andrew, and, and for people that are interested, these, at least GPT-2, not GPT-3, because it's so much larger, it's not accessible. GPT-2, you could download yourself. Um, it takes a bit of code experience with Python, but um, I have it running personally to do my image work. I, I did have to run it on a on a parallel. Like it, I couldn't get it working on Windows, so it, it works a little bit better on Linux. Personally, I know it works all right on Mac. I had a lot of issues on Windows, but it's something that you could download and train um, yourself. So yeah, that's a that's a very good point. It's open source is the is the the key there. The, GP, the core GPT models. GPT two is yeah. GPT two yeah. is open source. The 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 core models of it are. And just to, to quickly go back to uh, I think the point that um, I. I uh, Liz was making um, in her, her question about um, what we can do when we get a live audience. I mean, there is, we are thinking of having some kind of online installation which would run in parallel with, uh, with the live performance. Uh, and and, the, and the, the, let's just say that the music is going to be set in a conventional um, compositional way, but we will also, we're trying to figure out ways in which we can build and um, receiving, for example, text live, a text from uh, an audience member that could be fed back and um, sung back, um, sort of relatively in real time. So each performance might actually have some differences. So having that kind of um, uh, flexibility is something that we're looking at. Uh, and and uh, and again, it comes back to the idea of the audience discovering that they are complicit in a in a Turing test. Great. I'm going to read a comment that I, is uh, directed to Vlad. I'm sure you can see it or flip dots. Um, I'd just like to share my thoughts on creative coding explored through thrip, flip dot display by Vlad. I believe the attention paid to each design of imagery on the dot display allows us to read, hear the sound of each particular dot, which is interpretation of algorithms and coding AI. Its variety of positioning in space, I think it enhances the soundscape of overall experience when it will be in person. So someone here really responding to the sensory ex uh, experience of the flip dots um, as a kind of translation of what algorithmic action might look like or feel like. Yeah. Um, Q, are there any other questions that you feel like we've missed in this thread that you really want to bring into the room? And if folks have final yeah. thoughts or questions, we've got about five minutes. I think yeah, there's, there's one here um, from Christine. She says, I was wondering in terms of the AI and the very tech side of things, did you all approach it as creatives working in the theater and opera? So indeed as people searching for a story 
or is there anyone exploring it purely as a data, data scientist? Where or is there a line for you between the form as a standalone, which I think is really fascinating, and using it as a device to make an opera as a bottom line? Um, yeah, so something that, that's sort of interesting to the group at large, and there are some others, uh, colleagues here at Yale um, who are fascinated by um, uh, visual representations of data. Uh, so we've done some experiments and in, in that in conjunction with neuroscience, um, genetics, um, and, um, and lately looking at um, uh, collective behavior of animals. So flocking and schooling. So there, there are sort of some allied um, projects that are on the periphery of this that we are slowly kind of <laughs> filtering, um, filtering into it. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, this sort of generated quite a community of, of, of endeavor, um, which is really exciting and somewhat sort of overwhelming, quite frankly, but yeah, that's a great comment. This is also a great follow up to that, actually, Matthew, which was also a question in the thread that um, Alan Turing is such a natural fit for this process, but is this process seeding other topics for folks? So you just talked about flocking and sort of the visual representation of data. Uh, for everyone in this group, creative group, are there other ideas that are coming to the surface for you, for other projects um, born out of the experience that we've been having together? It's a wall of silence. <laughs> I don't even know where to start almost. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel, I feel like it's, for me, it's becoming less and less about the concrete Alan Turing, like the person that existed and more about the legacy and the perception and idea um, of his work and what he left behind, which I think is really, you know, like just a super fascinating shift to encounter. And I think what's also exciting about Alan Turing is he really, you know, with, with working with AI, he was so kind of ahead of his time and in like a philosophical way thinking about what is intelligence and he was always taking mathematics and things and putting them and seeing how they fit with the natural world so i think what's been super exciting in this exploration is just like what what is and seeing all these patterns and what the ai is generating has further deepened my understanding of what my own intelligence is and kind of what makes us human because i feel like that's often the blowback of AI is like, well, it, it's not intelligence or consciousness because it doesn't have these things that I have as a human. Um, but I found too, in how much data mining goes on in the world and everything that like, as humans, our intelligence is starting to show that we are a subset of data and different things too. So I think, um, uh, it's, it's been a really interesting philosophical thing to, think about uh, as well as technical. I think just piggybacking on that, Tyler, it's, that to me is part of why it is so essential that it's a live experience. There's something like deeply human and physical and organic about this technological idea. And so to separate us from each other and other human bodies in space would kind of be missing a crucial element of what's at the heart of the piece. I think that's a perfect note to end on. And Matthew, I'm just going to hand it over to you if there's any acknowledgements or appreciations you want to offer before we hand it over to um, Andrew to close us out. Well, first, we'd like to uh, thank uh, Andrew and Emily for uh, hosting us and uh, walking us through this process. And uh, so, big thanks to you and everybody at Level Up. This has been a wonderful opportunity. Um, this is our first international engagement. Uh, so, we're <laughs> We're thrilled about that. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, those at Yale that are supporting us. So we've already mentioned the Digital Humanities Lab, which is part of the Yale University Library, um, the Yale Center for British Art, and uh, in particular, the uh, Yale Center for Collaborative Arts and Media, directed by Dana Kawas, who have been, they have been wonderful in, in supporting us. And, uh, and I personally would love to thank uh, all of the team. It's been a remarkable thing that you can get this many people together twice a week uh, to, to work on um, this project. And uh, I would also like to thank, of course, the, um, 
uh, the archive and the archivists at King's College Cambridge, who uh, have been wonderful also. So thank you all. Hi, thank you. Thank you everyone so much for being here. This has been absolutely fantastic, really, really quite interesting. And I am so excited to see where you go with this. And uh, I signed up for the website um, on your Instagram and uh, I really, recommend everyone everyone that's watching to take the chance to take the time to head to the website sign up and uh keep tabs on where you go with this project so thank you all for sharing today really really glad and thank you vlad for bringing this to my attention in the first place and uh really looking forward to your chat later on in the symposium and uh just for everyone else again i want to say uh if you have the chance to please donate if you've enjoyed this particular serum this uh this event or any of our other events, um, you can donate on the Level Up website or on the ADC's website or on CanadaHelps.org. Please take a moment if you can to do that. And uh, tomorrow uh, we have our next event at 2 p.m. Eastern or 11 a.m. Pacific. We have Smile with Brittany Bland, where she will be exploring how digital practices can help individuals find the strength in their own voice, live their truth and project that into the world. So that's tomorrow afternoon. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today and have a great day. We'll see you all around the symposium.